Okay, let's work on a slightly bigger example here. Uh, just adding a little bit of complexity to our world. Right? In this world, we have two assets, stock C and stock T. And we have three states of the world, boom, normal, and here the bust is called a recession. But the practical nature of our formulas means that all we are going to change here is adding a third term for this normal state. Right? Otherwise, the process is the same. It's just going to take us a little bit longer. Right? So our formula for expected return, again, let me expand this formula. I'll do it just for stock C here. I'll expand the formula, the sum of the probability of each state times the return in each state gets expanded to be the probability of the boom state times the return in the boom state plus the probability of the normal state times the return in the normal state plus the probability of the uh, recession state times the return in the recession state. Okay. So notice again, all I've done is put one more term into this expansion. And no, ma no matter how many potential states in the world, if I had a forced state, I would just have a fourth term. Right? So I could include any number of potential states, although the, the calculation would get more and more tedious the more and more states that I have. Okay. So now I can just plug in my numbers. I'm just looking for uh, what I have here. So the probability of the boom state is 30%. So there's a 30% chance that we have a boom. And in the boom for stock C, right here's C, in the boom for stock C, the return is 15% plus a 50% chance of a recession, I mean, a, of a normal state times the return for stock C in the normal state of 10%. Finally, a 20% chance of a recession times a 2% return for stock C in the event of a recession. Again, watch our order of operations and do our algebra correctly here, and we get an expected return of 9.9% for stock C. For T, we do the same thing. We have the same probabilities of the states. We have different outcomes in each state. So the probability of the boom is 30%, but T has a 25% return in the boom. A 50% chance of a normal state and T has a 20% return in the normal state. And then finally, a 20% chance of a recession in which case T makes only 1%. Again, do our algebra here and get 17.7% .7 as our expected return. Okay. Now, what I want us to remember is that just because stock T here has a larger expected return than stock C, does not necessarily mean that stock T is a better stock or a better investment. All it means is that it has a higher expected return. But what we know about return is based on the fundamental rule of finance, that risk and return trade off one for one. So by definition, a stock with a larger expected return also has a larger risk. So we cannot, that's why we can't characterize an asset without knowing both its risk and its return. Because this is only a better investment if it has a better risk to return trade-off. Not just a better return, because we may have a very high risk for undertaking this stock, a very big spread in returns. And we can see that the risk is gonna be higher. The spread in returns is larger than it is here. So what we have to do is look at the standard deviation of both of these assets, and then we can start to think about whether uh, which of these assets is preferable. And remember that preferable is based on our preference setting, and our preference is, uh, is going to be unique to each of us. 
right? So I might prefer an asset that has a larger return and comes with a higher risk, and you might prefer an asset that has a lower return because it has a lower risk. And there's nothing wrong with either one of those options. Our risk preferences are just that, they're preferences. Right? But to even talk about that, we need to first calculate the variance and then calculate the standard deviation for both of these assets. Okay? So we want to calculate the variance of the return on stock C. And again, I will, uh, I'll enumerate, I'll, I'll expand this formula just for the first one. Right? So that's the, right, the sum of the probability of each state times the difference between the return in each state and the expected return of the asset squared. And so here it looks like this, the probability of the boom times the actual return in the boom state minus the expected return of C squared plus the probability of the normal state times the return in the normal state, the actual return minus the expected return of stock C squared. Finally, plus the probability of the recession state times the difference between the actual return in the recession state and the expected return for stock C squared. Okay. And now we can plug our numbers in. There is a 30% chance of a boom, 30% probability of a boom state. The actual return for stock C in the boom is 15%, and we calculated the expected return to be 9.9%, .9%, and that difference should be squared. There is a 50% probability of a normal state, and in the normal state, the actual return for C is 10% minus the expected return of 9.9 .9 squared, plus a 20% probability of the recession state, in which case the actual return for C is only 2%, and the expected return of 9.9% .9 is subtracted, and that difference is squared. Again, be careful here with your order of operations. That's the biggest errors I see with these problems is people just messing up the calculation, right? None of this is complicated, but if you uh, mess up your order of operations, uh, you won't get the right answer. So we do all our algebra correctly. We get a variance of 0 0.002028, right? And then we want the standard deviation. So we take the square root of the variance to get the standard deviation, right? So I take the square root of 0 0.002028 and I get 0 0.045, which is 4.5%. That's the risk of stock C. Right? Then for T, the variance of the return on T, right? Well, we have a 30% chance of a boom state. And in the boom state, stock T has a 25% actual return minus its expected return of 17.7, .7, and that difference is squared. A 50% probability of a normal state, in which case T has a 20% expected return minus 17.7, .7, its expected return, that difference squared. Finally, a 20% probability of a recession where stock T has an expected return of only 1% minus its expected return squared. We do our algebra correctly, we get a variance for stock T of 0 0.007441. Take the square root of the variance to get the standard deviation and I get a standard deviation of 0 0.08626 which is 8.26%. Okay. Oh, rather, 8.626%. Okay. And now we can characterize these assets. And notice that stock T has about double the expected return and about double the risk, which is exactly what we expect based on what we know about risk and return. 
risk and return trade off one for one. So if we have double the risk or double the return, we should, we must have double the risk. Now, does that mean that T is by definition better than C? No, not necessarily. Right? Now in this example, it's pretty clear that T is the better option because in each of the states, the return is higher, right? much higher in the boom, much higher in the normal, and only slightly less in the recession. So even though there's more risk here, because risk is the variation in actual outcomes, uh, it's probably a better asset. Right? But in practice, we wouldn't, right? If with more, uh, with more states or a more realistic example where uh, the states weren't knowable, right? a stock with double the return and double the risk may be preferable to some people and not preferable to others. And again, that's just based on our personal risk preferences.